Uh, before I begin, just a little bit of word of warning. Uh, I'm a bit of an undomesticated Mexican, so I speak really, really, really fast. <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, if at some point somebody misses a point, just raise a hand. I'd rather have we have a conversation than just a presentation. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me here. It's a, it's a real honor, it's a real pleasure being here. Share some of the work that we do with you. Uh, let me give you a bit of a background. Uh, if you're ever in the vicinity of MIT, come visit us. We are on Building 9, easily accessible, open lab. You can walk in all the time. People will be happy to show you what we do. Um, what I'm going to show you today um, is not only my work, but it's the work of a very large group of researchers that we all form the Sensible City Lab. Um, what we do fundamentally is we do a process that is simultaneously science and design. We want to do a social innovation. Uh, we usually get our grubby hands on data, try to analyze that data, uncover hidden realities, uh, but then go back into a design cycle from what we learn from the data, uh, just also try to propose the new systems that could become part of urban futures. Uh, we're fortunate enough that we do this uh, all over the world, and one of the advantages of having such a great team over at MIT is that the team itself is very multidisciplinary. We have anywhere from physicists, mathematicians, architects, designers. We've had sociologists. We have biologists. Take your pick. Uh, people from all over the world. Uh, China, Iran, Italy. I'm the Mexican in the room. We have Brazilians. And when you have this extremely messy conversation, you try to put a, an architect, a sociologist, and a physicist in a room, uh, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, but when it works, and we're able to catalyze those conversations into particular challenges of cities, uh, that's when the magic happens. We do what we do mostly because if we think about the core challenges that we're facing as humanity um, right now and in the near future, when we talk about cities being about 2.5, occupying about 2.5% of the world's landmass, and over 50% of the global population, uh, about 75% of the world's energy consumption, and 80% of the world's CO2 emission. And as this keeps growing in the future, um, what happens is fundamentally a lot of the big challenges that we face as mankind, we're going to make or break them in cities. There's no other way around it. We are an urban species. We have been an urban species for more than a decade now and growing. And, and this is where we have to meet not all, but many of the challenges. Uh, but we know that technology has always played a critical factor, in, both in the evolution of societies, as well as in the manifestation in the places that we inhabit, in this case, our cities. And if we think about today, Today we're going under a profound transformation as we move from industrial and post-industrial society, which are essentially atom-based societies, or so, societies that are very good at putting things, physical things, together. And we move into, uh, we become digital societies, uh, knowledge societies, where it's more about the information that we handle, the bits, we transition from atoms to bits. That has an impact in the things we do. So if we think about the industrial era, right, and we take an iconic, object of the industrial era, a car. Post-industrial is fundamentally more complexity added to it, but it's the same object. But then when we come into the information era, what we have are objects that cease to have a single function, cease to have a single purpose of design. And because they interact with information, they can be simultaneously a car, but at the same time, they are platforms that both generate, process, and transact information. If you take an autonomous vehicle, yes, it will move you from point A to B, but in the process of doing so, because of the sensors uh, that it has installed, that it needs to operate, it's effectively scanning the environment. It's effectively looking and mapping uh, everything that surrounds it. And if you think about it systems-wise, as we increase the number of these architectures, then the volume of information fundamentally grows and grows and grows to the point that it becomes ridiculous and growing. So what we do is we're trying to look at this mediation, if you want, in between our physical cities uh, and their digital twins. But having a keen eye, or at least trying to have a keen eye, 
on maintaining a human-centered design. And by design, I, I not only mean the form, but also the function and also the systems and also the institutions, because when we talk about cities, we have to talk about institutions. So if we go to the process of city making, where uh, to cite uh, Henri Lefebvre, we go from imagining places and then we go and build them. And most of the time, a lot of people think that that's where making cities stop. You, are, you have a building, you put a street, you build it and that's it. But the reality is that there is also a social appropriation that happens over time. Society over time effectively adopts a space and they make it a place by turning in all of their daily activities or some of their daily activities into, into that place and socially encoding that. Uh, and that's when you can say that a place is truly made. So something similar happens when we're talking about the digital platforms. So if we think about the right, the right to the city, as, as Harvey would put it, in creating this capacity for people to transform their cities, to really have agency, to generate change at various scales within their environments, then we also have to think about in our digital era, what is the right to the digital city? And that has to do fundamentally with the loop of the information that we keep generating more and more and more and the capacity to simultaneously maximize its social benefits while minimizing the social risk, but always having layers of transparency to create an even societal conversation. That's much trickier said than done. But the fact of the matter is um, that it's trickier to do because one of the dirty secrets of digital technologies is that they are fundamentally undemocratic. And I know we've all been hearing, especially in the past 20 years, on how digital technologies are democratizing our future, we're giving tools to people, we're giving more information to people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is that for digital technologies to become powerful, they need to do two core things. One is they need to centralize a lot of information. In our algorithmic world, the most powerful algorithms that we operate come about by amassing large amounts of information. And that centralizing power is undemocratic in its nature. And the other is to operationalize this, many of these architectures are vertically integrated. So while they do have a forward-looking face to the public that gives them access as platforms, the mediation on who controls those platforms and who controls the information and its byproduct, it's a very, very tricky conversation which is no surprise that today, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, governments and city hall are lagging behind companies, right? Still 80% of the world's data reside in private hands. So the real question is what do we do with it? So I'm gonna show you some of the projects in the lab just to, just to give you an idea. There's a lot more in our website. Feel free to just browse it if you're curious. Uh, but I'll give you some examples. Uh, Tripedia is a project that we did uh, with the World Economic Forum uh, a few years back. And in here, the project was about how do we quantify our green environments in cities? How do we know how many trees we have in cities? To put it into the labs conversation where there's people from all over the world, that basically amounts to a discussion on my city is greener than your city. Okay, so let's test it out. Uh, today, if cities want to do this, they usually carry out an inventory. They will have people going counting tree to tree, keeping an inventory and tagging it. Um, in many research spaces, what they're doing is they're looking at satellite pictures and effectively scanning satellite pictures and satellite, uh, looking at the net area of green in the city and calculating a percentage. But if we think about it from the perspective of available data, then we have entities like Google who already went to the trouble of take, essentially taking uh, 360 pictures all over the world with 10 to 15 meter spacing, so that could be useful. So what we did here was a process where we, uh, we scraped Google's uh, Street View data, all the data, right? They have it from cities all over the world. And it's beautifully georeferenced, so they've already done that job for us. And then what we did is ask the data the question of how many green, how much green is in the city. We did this by 
uh, using AI, training AI to identify trees within the 360 spheres of each picture. And the AI identifies uh, trees, identifies green, and because the data is now georeferenced, that means that you can automate the process. And in one fell swoop, we can have dynamic maps right, uh, of cities all over the world and really look at mass scale that function of, uh, and that knowledge of greenery, right? Um, and we analyze multiple cities with this, which essentially you can just run down the process as long as you have this type of data available. Sometimes city governments are concentrators of data, and they are sitting on great data. And one example of this is that we did a project in New York City. New York, a few years back, they, uh, they put on open data, all the data of their taxi system, right? And, uh, and you know, if you think about it, it's just lat, long, timestamp, and meter data. And what we did is ask it a fundamental question, right? Uh, how does New York use its taxi system? So what we did is we analyzed about 150 million taxi rides over a year in New York. And if you look at the map, actually, uh, every yellow dot is a pickup. Every blue dot is a drop-off. Uh, there's no streets in this map. Actually, as you zoom out, you will map out the whole of New York uh, with no streets, just the density of dots. Uh, it's really interesting. Right out of the bat, you can see a lot of things, right? It's fairly easy to get a cab in Manhattan. Good luck if you're in Brooklyn. Really good luck if you're in Brooklyn. Uh, really good luck if you're in Brooklyn. Uh, the, uh, you will always find a cab at the airport. There's an overabundance of cabs, both in LaGuardia as well as in JFK. But when you have that density, of points, when you have that density of trips, we're talking in the millions here, we build an application that would tell us, okay, pick two spots, and it will tell you how many trips from one side to the other, back and forth, and it's, it's usually in the thousands. When you're in the thousands, then the next question is, wait a minute, if so many trips happen from point A to B, then the next question, the follow-up question is, how many of those trips could be shared? So we did an analysis uh, using a, a type of, um, um, spatially collapsing networks uh, over areas uh, to answer that question. And it turns out that in New York City, if New Yorkers are willing to share a cab, back then, this is, this is like a few years back, Uberpool wasn't, wasn't in vogue yet. But if New Yorkers were able to share a cab, which was a big question, and they were willing to go out of their way by two minutes, 47% uh, of the taxi rides in New York could be shared. If you increase the delta to five minutes, it actually goes to over 80%. That is a big number. And you're sitting there saying, oh my God, if at any random point, I walk down the streets of New York and I see all these taxis moving, think about the scale of the system one, think about the impact that those taxis actually have on traffic and on air pollution and such. Uh, we ran the analysis on other cities. We looked at Vienna, Singapore, San Francisco, and the curb actually holds. So then the follow-up question, which is a very nerdy research thing to do, you keep digging questions and questions and questions, was, okay, then how many taxes do we need? Uh, so what's the minimum fleet did in New York City? So using uh, real data, basically what you're seeing here are all the movements of taxes uh, in and out the city. And when we apply the function of the collapsible networks, then we're able to effectively create buffer zones, take out taxis from the system while maintaining the same level of quality. But what is the output of this? At the end of the day, the output of this, it's not only the research finding, but it's also an algorithm. It's an algorithm that you can tap into a dispatch system. But again, going back to the point where you're able to do this only by amassing very large amounts of data and information. So that's the cycle. And here we are removing taxes, and at the end of the day, we're able to remove uh, close to 50% of the taxes in New York City. Uh, so you can have really deep impacts just by understanding the complexity, the, the, those invisible realities that we often fail to see. Uh, but we also like to create new systems. And Underworld is a project where we did that. This was inspired by a work done in uh, the 1853-1854 cholera epidemic in the UK, in London, where Jon Snow, not the Game of Thrones Jon Snow, the Victorian London Jon Snow, 
uh, Jon Snow, uh, back at that time, people didn't really know if cholera was a water transmitted disease or an air transmitted disease. And cholera was running rampant in London. So Jon Snow, what he did is he effectively mapped people that were becoming infected and dying from cholera. And he created this map and he was able to trace down uh, those people uh, that they all had, they all drank water from a water from a public pump that was actually downstream from a hospital. And that is the birth of modern epidemiology. So now we're thinking, wait a minute, you know, what, what is the equivalent today with these technologies? And what is the information that we flush down, literally, down the toilet, tells us about our health and how do you mine that information? Now today, if you want to mine biological data, you go to a treatment plant, you're going to get about 6% of human material. Uh, and it's, of course, it's all going to be downstream, so you're not going to have any spatial resolution on it. Um, so we went, um, uncovered manholes, and tried to get some samples. Uh, we discovered very quickly that we didn't like doing this. <laughs> Real quick. Uh, so, so, being nerds, uh, we did a bunch of robots. Uh, so this is Mario. It goes down pipes. This is Luigi, it's the slimmer and faster version. It also goes down pipes. Uh, they might look exotic, they're not, trust me, they're not. They're made with, with parts that we got off the shelf that we put them together. They're fairly cheap, they're like servo motors, Arduino boards. Um, but what's really important is what they do. Because now this is, these are robots that you can effectively deploy on the manholes and you can control them via an app. And as you control them, they will hook them up, and they will just go down, and they have micro pumps, and they will just suck sample data. Uh, could you, by any chance, tap somewhere towards the middle of this video? Because the video is actually a little bit long. Like, there's a team deploying. That's Mario going down. A little forward. Further down. There. That's Luigi going down. And it just goes down the sewer. We put an app to control it, lower it, getting it up, sucking dirty water. What's interesting is what you get out of it. So when you go to a, at a manhole level, or a block level, and you get about 76% human material, which is a dramatic increase. Because you understand the flows of the sewage, then you can also trace the differences. And from the data, we're uncovering thousands of bacteria, thousands of virus, full biological profile. And that is very, very important health data. So we've been deploying this in places like Kuwait, in places like Seoul, we're able to get bacteria, viruses, chemical traces. Uh, right now there's this whole uh, opioid crisis in the US. This will read opioid crisis. But now you get into this funky question on, oh, wow, this is very cool data. It's also very powerful. It's also somewhat intimate data. What do you do with it? How do you operationalize? Who should have this data? That's a very tricky thing. And that question goes back to a process that a lot of cities are going on today. As they digitize their infrastructures, what they're looking at is that there's a new, a new set of questions that before they didn't really have to think through. And I'll give you one example of a, of a project I worked on uh, a few years ago with the most mundane thing that you can find in urban infrastructure, street lights. If you think about street lights, they've been around forever, over a thousand years, actually. Uh, we put them everywhere. There's a reason why we put them everywhere. They bring life to a place. But when I say we put them everywhere, is we really put them everywhere. And over the years, streetlights have become one of the largest networked electrical infrastructures in the world. There's over a billion streetlights worldwide and growing, growing fast. Especially now that they are, they are transitioning from high pressure sodium and halogen to LEDs. And in that transition, there's a moment, there's a technological moment where if you think about streetlights all throughout history, the thought process of streetlight, because it was one single function, the thought process and, and the technological evolution of streetlights was how do I get a better light and how do I get a cheaper light? And we moved from oil to whale oil to gas to arc light to halogen, silver halide, high pressure sodium, and now LED, basically under that function. Now, when you have LEDs, LEDs are digital, which means that you can also tap them into networks of information. And when you think about streetlights as a distributed network of information, 
what that means is that streetlights in the future, if they're, if they're able to capture data, capture information, they're worth far more for the real estate that they hold because of the information potential than for the function of light. Light is the gateway drugs for adoption, except that cities are configured the other way around. Streetlights are being run by a utilities department or the city electrician, and those are usually departments that they don't wake up in the morning thinking about you know, data models, data structure. Oh my God, somebody asked about privacy today. What? Right? It has nothing to do with light. It turns out that it has. So what we've been doing here is we've been developing, we worked this with Philips, a modular architecture of sensors. What would a street light of the future as an as a urban scale data gathering platform would mean? So it's a modular architecture that we follow two principles. One is you don't duplicate sensors. You can actually tap, uh, tap multiple applications on a single sensor, and then you combine those sensors to create more applications. Those applications, they don't need to run on streetlights. They can run on completely different system, completely separate system. And this is a list that, should, that goes and goes and goes. Actually, for this experiment, uh, for this project, we did about 25 applications running on streetlights that we just did on the, the ideation and development. And I'll show you one. Uh, for example, one is, can streetlights help traffic management? And if yes, at the choke points, which are the, the street crossings, uh, that today we tend to optimize for traffic, uh, what would a human center intersection be like? And what's the streetlight role? So for this, we deploy, we use a bunch of sensors, uh, cameras, air quality monitors, uh, thermal cameras to maintain privacy. Uh, on people, on pedestrians, and here you can see the sensors, here you can see the air quality. Uh, but then what we did is we, we used AI on the video to look, detect, classify, and calculate the rate of velocity and change of the cars, but also correlate that with the presence of humans. Why is this important? Because on one hand, you can optimize the system and create a more efficient intersection from, from, a, from your experience point of view, nothing would change. This is all actuated on a traffic light that moves from red to green and back to red, except that now it's not at a fixed time. Now it's actually reading the environment dynamically and it's allocating variations of time. And those minute variations do have a deep impact, both on the traffic as well as on the environment. But most important, because we're taking the humans into account and detecting them uh, into the system, it's also able to induce human-centered cycles. If it's minus 20 degrees outside, and there's some humans, there's some people there waiting, I might want to get them out first. If it's raining, or if they're in Delhi, which is extremely polluted at the moment, it's a health hazard, I might actually stop the traffic for a little while to get the people out of the way. So it's those kind of cycles, and now we have greater intelligence. And this is just... <laughs> One of many applications. We've been doing things on parking. We've been doing things on air quality monitoring, uh, uh, accident detection, jaywalking, uh, just to name a few. But now, when we go back to the cities, and we've talked with cities uh, all over the world about what they're doing, because the street lights is one of the is one of the hot topics of smart cities. Everybody's doing a smart light project. It's really funny because the definition is actually very fuzzy. Uh, it ranges from cities that say, I don't care, I just want a light. Most cities actually say, you know, I have a smart street light program, and it's all about creating a better power management, which kind of defeats the purpose, because it's, again, on the track, on the thought process of how do I get a better light, how do I get a cheaper light, and that's where they stayed. Some of them are putting solutions on the poles, and some of them are really integrating things. But the more you move towards urban platforms, the more you think in terms of integration, what you find is that these kind of models are top-down perspective. This only city hall or utilities companies can execute it. Whereas when you move as a platform, you can really open the tap of access to people to play with that. And that's very important because the fact of the matter is that cities cannot do it alone. But they typically don't let anybody play. So when you move to what's happening to the environment, you have companies that are pushing a technocentric narrative and cities that are pushing on constraints anywhere from 
budget to legal to operational. And the big fuzzy thing in the middle is always on data ownership and data privacy. Those are, those are the two main components uh, of conflict in the conversation today. But the challenge here is that if cities don't do it right, either they face, which is very, it's, it's probably the biggest risk, is that they will fragment the different solutions that they tap. Uh, they will still generate a lot of data, but there's going to be no interoperability, and it's going to be a messy system. That's very, that, that, for many cities, I'm seeing that as a forecast. Uh, it presents challenges on cities understanding the value, because uh, in, in this, you move from looking at streetlights as a fixed value asset to streetlights as a platform that will multiply its value over time, but you cannot quantify that value a priori. And cities usually don't have pretty good models on doing that, on handling that, handling that uncertainty, uh, which of course will affect operations and governance. Is there a role for cities to, for, for example, uh, operate data marts? The city being the central holder of a data marketplace within regulations and safety for data? And how do you ensure um, equitable access? So those are some of the new questions that we are facing. I was going to present a robot, but I know that you guys saw a robot yesterday, so I'm going so to skip this. Except the one thing that we did here, which was important, is that there is a process that we did here on bringing people into the project. So I've, I've been working on this project for a while. And this is actually an exercise of co-design where the conversation that we started with people is, here's the platform, yeah, yeah, autonomous boats, now what the hell do we do with it? And how do you communicate with it? So we actually had to do this dynamics using VR so that the people would get a sense of the scale and the space, and then locals, uh, we did this in Amsterdam, they would come about ideas to use, and this is a series of workshops that we run, and this is how we came about some of the uses, like trash collection uh, and such, but it's only but by bringing people into the conversation. Uh, so what are the takeaways? The takeaways is that we have to think about what truly means when we digitalize our infrastructures, when we put sensors and we talk about data, uh, both in the capacity to reveal hidden realities, uh, as well as in our capacity to design and have a sense of agency in the way we transform our cities. Um, keeping in mind that there is the democracy paradox, the, the digital democracy paradox. We tend to think the social narrative is that digital technologies tend to push towards democracy. That is not always the case because of vertical integration and concentration of information. Therefore, the management of that power, uh, it's very important to do it responsibly. And there is definitely a role for City Hall in enabling that social discussion. This goes in part by shifting from a solutionist perspective me as a city, I bought solution A, B, C, versus thinking really about platforms, that those platforms, you can recombine them into solutions, but you can allow for, a more, uh, for greater degrees of experimentation and social experimentation. And in the development of those platforms, okay, and in the design of those platforms, we have to keep in mind that design is a political exercise. One good example. We chose to put a thermal sensor on the streetlight because we wanted to maintain certain degrees of privacy at the data capture level. And that is a political exercise. That puts a little bit of the uh, creativity and ingenuity. Uh, but all of this, ultimately, you have to think, the fundamental question is, is this system as I'm transforming really helping us enable the next step in this discussion now to the digital rights of the city? which is a fundamental citizen's right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, a world with insight a, in the use of data. Ricardo, you highlighted the use of data and the importance of understanding it and in the context of city governance and rethinking city governance, you pose quite a few big questions for cities and, uh, and governments and alluding to that they're kind of behind from a, a corporate point of view. So I'm going to force you to answer some of your own questions. Oh, damn it. 
<laughs> which is, how does a city tackle this? I mean, from your experience working with cities, where yes. do you start in this um, of understanding data, privacy, the human rights discussion yes. that we had yesterday? So, to me, it's very clear that there needs to be a redesign on, I'm going to say, the typical city hall structure. Not all city halls are created equal, but most they still function with a siloed mentality, right? And you have departments that not only operationally, but legally, okay, they are constrained. And they are constrained to interoperate, okay? And they are constrained to, outside of very shallow conversations on some joint projects that they do, most of the time they run under their own inertia. And that scales all the way up. If you, if you really want to be uh, objective about it, right? You see areas siloed operating, manifesting that operation through their budget, the real will of government, you could say happens at the budget level. Follow the money. Follow the money. But what you're having here is a question that is, okay, hold on. The nature of what we're creating, because we're now shifting it from single function to multifunction, you cannot silo it, okay? So, uh, fortunately, we have a lot of experiences, most of them in the private sector, about how to operationalize that multifunctionality. And that has to do with treating data as a horizontal entity that effectively spans across all government because then it's able to coordinate the possibilities. Uh, so number one, it's very important. Um, the cities usually have IT departments or CTOs. Um, in many cities, basically what they do is they're the ones that buy the computers <laughs> and depreciate <laughs> after three or five years, and that's about it. Oh, and they take care of the open data program. But what you're talking about here is to have areas that are really capable of seeing, okay, uh, we have public safety. What is the digital evolution of public safety? Now from an informational point of view, meaning that you have a dual function. One is I need to not just take care of public safety, but hopefully improve it over time. But at the same time, there is going to be this informational byproduct that comes from public safety. Some of it is going to be extremely sensitive. Some is going to be extremely useful, okay? And the way you articulate that usefulness, not only within City Hall, but in a way that you have the capacity to have transparency with your citizens and saying, okay, this is the data that is being collected. This is how we're gonna use it. This is the data that we let you play with. And these are the steps and circumstances under which we let you play with this data. And these are all the combinations that you're doing. Like I said, City Hall can't do all the combinations. They just can't. Which is why in this space, you're, you're, you're hearing a lot of talk about ecosystems. It's all about enabling the ecosystem. Uh, and then when you get into that dynamic, it's really interesting because I, I, I've seen in my research, a lot of the uh, misconceptions start falling about. I'll give you one example. There's potentially no more controversial sensor than a camera. We're all afraid of cameras. Big Brother is watching. Uh, and we have historical reasons to be wary of cameras. Uh, yet if you really think about it, uh, it's not, a, it's not a single cultural perspective. Like the perspective on cameras that I see in other places around the world is very different. I come from Mexico and trust me, people want cameras in Mexico, okay? I've been to China many times this year and people not only want cameras, they're actually very proud of their cameras, which to me was super weird, but it is. Uh, so the reality is, how do you have an objective conversation yeah. about cameras? Because today, when we think about cameras, we think about surveillance. The fact of the matter is that that surveillance piece, we kind of lost it 25 years ago. Still have to catch up in regulating it. But then if I'm in a city like London that has hundreds of thousands of cameras, the real question should be not, hey, you're putting cameras for surveillance, they're already there. The real question from the civil society should be, what the hell am I getting out of this, right? Are there any other things that I could get out of the cameras? I mean, if, I, if at least I'm seeding some of my privacy away, what else are you doing with it? I'm already paying the cost. And cities are a bit shy in having those kind of conversations because they have. Do you haven't think they're shy, or they don't know where to, to ask or uh, who I to think, address? I, I, I think it's I think it's three things actually. 
some of them are shy. Some of them, they're just like, boom, cameras. Oh, shit, I'm not going to touch that. Right? And every time a citizen comes and says cameras, I'm going to say, oh, it's public safety, and it's only the police that have access to that data, and that's kind of like the easy, quick way out. Um, some cameras, some cities actively don't want to talk about it. Uh, in fact, there are cities that have sensors and they're turning, they're shutting them down in order to avoid the political conversation, which is a little bit about trying to swim countercurrent given the technological times. Uh, but many cities, simply what they don't have is the policy structure behind to have a reasonable conversation or the methodological approach to have that conversation. I'll give you an example. Uh, Portland and San Diego. Uh, they both installed uh, smart lighting systems. They've actually, they bought them from GE Current, which is literally the same system. Portland decided to shut down their sensors. After No, 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 they, they, the they, they like played their sensors. Some of the functionality, like Wi-Fi, it's on, but then like the whole lot of the catalog of sensors, like, oh, we're not gonna get there. I have a very politically active population where we're not gonna get in that discussion. San Diego, on the other hand, what they did, they created a chief data officer who's actually in charge of doing this horizontal policy. And they've been, as, as they've been installing, one of the largest installations of smart lights in the US, as they've been putting more, star, more uh, smart lights um, in the ground, they've been, number one, having conversations with residents. Hey, this is your new street light. It does many things. But it also, let me tell you all the data that it gets. By the way, let me invite you to a hackathon. So ultimately, what I hear, it, it's about storytelling, transparency, um, and being involved as opposed to a top-down sensor strategy. It's about transparency. I don't think it's about storytelling. I think it's about telling people. Institutionally speaking, we're taking care of the platform so that it works, but it works and it's also safe, but we want you to tell the story. We want you to make the story. And we want to have a continuous open conversation. Yeah, sure, I get that. But, but storytelling in the sense that y you uh, use a, a language and a metaphor um, that suits the, uh, the residents where they are. Yes. In a sense that uh, instead of using bureaucratic terminology, Absolutely. You, bring it to, uh, you bring it home, so to speak. In terms of bringing it home, we need to bring this one home because veggie lunch is waiting for us. But what you guys do is quite unusual in the sense that you are an academic institution and you apply research uh, in real life, hand in hand, with, with cities. Yes. So when cities hear you speak <gasps> and a gulp of fear, how am I going to do this? Do you actually come and do hand holding and, and apply? Uh, as part of the research. As part of the research. I don't know if hand holding would be the way that I would oh, put it. Oh, come on. They want to hear that. Ah! <laughs> uh, we work very hand in hand with city. Hand in we try to find, uh, as, as, as research, we obviously try to find interesting spaces, right? Or interesting topics. The tricky is that most of the cities that approach to us, they have very acute problems, right? and they want us to solve those problems. And then we tell them, no, hold on, that's a consultancy gig. That's not a research gig. What I'm here is for us to have the creative freedom and the space to really be thinking about not your immediate problems, but your transformational process. And then from there, uh, Rowboat in Amsterdam was a very good case, is a very good case, right? Rowboat began because uh, Amsterdam came to us, and we're all talking about autonomous vehicles because it's the trendy thing to do. Uh, and then Amsterdam, oh, we want to do something with autonomous vehicles, and then we flipped it. We go like, wait a minute, what are you doing with your canal system? Because today it's filled with you know tourist boats, and that's about it, right? So you have a wasted system there. What is the equivalent? So where, what I'm hearing is that you don't want to be a consultant. You don't want to be told what to do. You want the creative freedom uh, to do research because you have a longer term approach to it. Part of it is that you have a longer term approach to it. Part of it is actually working with cities to really discover what would be the deep impact items in their transformation, right? So what is the new systems that are you going to create? Or what are some of these hidden realities that you may already have in your data? It doesn't need to be very long term in the future, right? The, the New York project has an immediacy. Actually, we published that. And within months, Uber came to us because they were thinking of Uber pool. Say, hey, you know, we kind of like this. Thank you. Another part of the lab. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a lot of things that you can 
Im almost immediately operationalize, but it's not the function of a lab to actually operationalize it. You uh, started your talk with saying you speak quickly. I've been trying to find a, an know. in between a, qu um, a sentence, and now I'm just going to abruptly go in. Yep. There's a hidden reality out there, behind there, lunch, and then when you guys come back, it will be one of the nine top speakers globally with a sharp, shrewd mind that has analyzed, looked at, and translated this into humor, which I think will give us the energy boost to go out into the world. Lunch, Alvaro. Good. Thank you, Ricardo. This is great. Thank you.